4.5, an algorithm for curve sketching. This is going to be our final um, lesson on curve sketching. I hope that I've done enough different types of questions that you've got a good grasp of, of curve sketching. And what I want to do today is go over um, the main characteristics of each of the function, the first derivative and the second derivative, what these things tell you so that even if your teacher doesn't give you a list of things and ask you to do a complete analysis, that you should be um, pretty good at knowing what to do without any cues. So you need to also rely on some of your knowledge that you gained in advanced functions, right? Because you should probably be able to give me a decent sketch of this, maybe without the exact maximum values or if there's points of inflection, you wouldn't know those from advanced functions, but uh, you can do that now. But you can give a basic sketch. You should know that uh, the denominator here is factorable. That, that would give you two odd vertical asymptotes, which means a function has to be going in opposite directions on each side of it, that sort of thing. Like bring in your knowledge from your other course while you're working with um, calculus as well. So let's take a look at this one here. So from the first, the function itself, and you know, I think just for this, I'm going to, I'm not gonna take the derivative with you. I'll tell you what the derivative and second derivative are so that you can uh, just, because it's, it's very tedious and time consuming for me to do every one of them with you. So I think if you um, have them already written out, it will save you some time or save me some time in explaining what you need to do for the curve sketching. So when I give a unit test for my students, Usually there is one final question that is a complete analysis. In order for them to do that, I would give the first and second derivatives because I'm not testing their skill on taking a derivative, I'm testing their skill on how to use the first and second derivatives. So there would probably be another part in the test where I'd say, find the second derivative and tell me where the function is concave up or concave down, that sort of thing. But for a complete curve sketching, it's kind of nice. I mean, if you make a mistake in here, it's bad for the teacher as well because it's really hard to correct when you've made a mistake in the basic part of the question. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what have we learned and which one of these equations or derivatives gives us certain characteristics of the curve. So when you're working with the function, the things you have to remember with is you're going to use this function to find any point on the graph, right? Don't use this one or this one. It, it, it happens, but don't do it. So what do you get from this function? So let's figure out some of the things that we know from this. The very first thing you're going to say is for x intercept. So this is going to give you x and y intercepts. It's going to give you vertical asymptotes and it's going to give you horizontal asymptotes. All the stuff you did in advanced functions, this is your calculus lesson, right? Okay, so for x-intercept, set f at x equal to zero. And if I set this equal to zero, I would have, and this is a big mistake students often make, um, x squared equals negative 4, or right away they'll jump and say, oh, plus or minus 2. But this is, there are no x-intercepts because I would have x squared equals negative 4. So no x-intercepts. Hmm, interesting start to the question, isn't it? Okay, how about the y-intercept? For y-intercept, set x equal to 0. Oh, that works. 0, 0, 4 divided by minus 4. So the y-intercept is minus 1. Notice I didn't say y equals minus 1. If I said y equals minus 1, I'm talking about a horizontal asymptote, right? Okay, so this is what we're getting from these things. We have the x-intercept, the y-intercept. Um, normally, you're asked for the domain. What is the domain of the function? So we're going to say it's x, we're using x, x is not, x is an element of real numbers, we'll say that first, and then x is not equal to, 
and you should know that the denominator here, this could be written as x plus 2, x minus 2, of course, right? That's the same thing. So x is not equal to plus or minus 2 because we don't want to make the denominator 0. So that also implies that the vertical asymptotes are going to be x equals plus or minus 2. Now, whether or not your teacher asks you to um, show the limit as you approach 2 from the left and the right, that's quite possible they might ask you that. I never did because, you know, if it's making the denominator 0 and, well, let's do it anyway. Okay, so let's just, so let's say the limit as x approaches, let's do 2 from the right of x squared. It has to be the limit of something. Okay, don't just say the limit is. It has to be of something. So if I put in 2 from the right, that means something very small after 2. So let's say 2.00001. Yeah, doesn't matter. So 2 from the right, even if I said 3, that would show this is positive and this is positive. So if it's positive, it's going to approach positive infinity. So if we say um, uh, 2 from the right, you'd say the limit is infinity but does not exist. So the limit does not, does not exist. So it approaches infinity, therefore d and e. You'd never say the limit is infinity. So from the right would be positive infinity. Um, 2 from the left, so the limit as x approaches, I'll, I'm just going to do one of these just so you have, in case your teacher likes you to do this, that uh, was never a quiet requirement of mine. So 2 from the left is something a little bit less than 2, so you could even put in 1 if you want. So 1 plus 4 is 5, but 1 plus minus 4 is negative, so it's going to approach negative infinity. And that means does not exist either. The limit does not exist. So, again, we knew that because, well, we didn't know if it was going to be up or down, but 2 from the right would be this asymptote here, x equals 2, and from the right it's going to be going, so it's going to go like this, and we know it's an odd asymptote, so it has to be going down on the other side. All right, so if this was 2. Okay, so we have vertical asymptotes. Now we need um, the horizontal asymptotes. So those are usually classified all together as asymptotes. Horizontal asymptote, what do I know? So the in this case here, this function has the same degree in numerator and denominator. So you should know that the horizontal asymptote is going to be the ratio of the leading terms, in this case, one over one. So the horizontal asymptote is y equals 1. Now, if your teacher wanted you to show that, you could do um, this little trick where you divide everything by the, by the highest degree in the denominator. So something like this. Am I still on the page? No, I'm not. Sorry. Uh, minus 4 over x squared. So these give you 1, and as x approaches infinity, these approach 0. And you could say that in here, as x approaches infinity, plus or minus 4 over x squared approaches 0. Therefore, um, y equals 1 is the horizontal asymptote, something like that. Okay, so in my class, if you said this and you said this, that is great. You know what they are. Okay, so that's all you get from the original function, right? So that's just like all this stuff here is original function. Now from the derivative, what do you get from a first derivative? Well, this is where you figure out where their critical values. Where are the critical values? So I'm going to say for critical values set f prime x equal to 0 <clears throat> and I get minus 16 x equals 0 and x is equal to 0. 
Okay, so I don't know if zero is a minimum or a maximum. I could use the, a second derivative test. So let's do both a first and second derivative test here because I don't think I've ever done both of them for you. So let's do this f prime x. We're testing zero. We have two other critical points, which are my asymptotes of plus or minus two. So what's happening to the slope to the left and right of these points? So let's say what happens at f prime when x is three. So if I put in three here, I would have um, minus 48, and this is positive. So that will be negative. Between zero and two, I put in one, that's minus 16 divided by a positive, that's also negative. Don't freak out when you get two of them like that, because remember, this is an asymptote here. To the left, so if I put in um, negative one now, this would make this positive over a positive. So it's going to be positive. And again, a negative number times a negative is a positive. Something squared is always positive. So this is going to be positive on this side. Okay, so that implies that zero, zero and what is the y coordinate? You plug it back into the original function and I get negative one is a maximum. Okay, so if we did a second derivative test, second derivative test would be what is f double prime at zero? So I plug that into here. <clears throat> f double prime at zero would be 64 over a negative number. So it's going to be less than zero. And if it's less than zero, you're sad, but you have a maximum because your mouth goes up to a maximum. Therefore, a maximum at zero minus one. Okay, so those are two options for checking for minimum or maximum values. This is first derivative test, first derivative test, and this is your second derivative test. Okay, so we found our maximum values, and now we're going to use our second derivative for points of inflection. For points of inflection, set f double prime x equal to zero, and I would have 48x squared equals negative 64. Hmm. No points of inflection. No real values, okay? You can't, no real numbers. Okay, so there are no points of inflection. But that doesn't mean there's no concavity to the function, right? It just means there's no change. There, there's none of these kind of things happening. No change in concavity. The, a function can be continually concave up or always concave down, right? Something like this. Like a parabola doesn't have any, any um, points of inflections or a fourth degree function. It's always concave up though, right? Okay, so let's talk first about, um, we'll do the intervals of increase and decrease. We should have put that under here because that's part of the first derivative. So intervals of increase. That's our first, our first little test here. So intervals of increase means where on my first derivative test is it positive. So we have between negative infinity and minus 2 and minus 2 to 0. And don't forget we're always using round brackets because round brackets indicate that you're not using the point. Okay, and we want decreasing interval. And again, you read it right off here. So between 0 and 2 and 2 and positive infinity. So 0 to 2 to, to infinity. There, I've got increase, and that all comes from the first derivative. You don't even need the second derivative. We could have done without this part, but we used it. Okay, so this one here now, we've got, um, there's no points of inflection, but we want to use a test to see what the concavity is. So I'm going to label this f double prime x, and I'm going to put the two critical values, which are my asymptotes, 
our vertical asymptotes on the line here, and I'm going to check the concavity on either side. So if I plugged in a zero into this equation, I would have um, 64 divided by a negative number. So that means the function is going to be concave down between minus two and two. So just because you don't have points of inflection, don't say, oh, there's no concavity. That would just be wrong. Okay, let's go to the other side. Three, three squared, nine big numbers, positive all on the top. I only want to know if it's positive or negative though, right? So I have positive up here and I'm squaring three. Three squared would be nine minus four is five cubed is positive. Everything's positive and it's going to be concave up. On the other side here, if I went to minus three, still the same number in the numerator, I'm squaring that x value. So I still get the same answer as I did on this side, right? So minus three squared is nine, minus four is five cubed, positive, so positive, and we're like this. Okay, so you have to state the intervals of concavity. So I'm gonna say concave up, and that would be between negative infinity and minus two and between two to infinity. And it's going to be concave down in this little zone here between minus two and two. Okay, so I've done all of the analysis that I need to do in order to sketch the curve. I don't know if you can see everything on this page. It's hard to get it all on, on the screen at once. Okay, so let's make a quick sketch of our function and we're gonna call that the end of chapter four. Hopefully I'll have time to get some practice tests up for you as well as I move along to chapter five. Okay, so we had vertical asymptotes at two and minus two. You should always label your axes. I know I sometimes don't either. So here's two. Here's my other, my other vertical asymptote at x equals minus 2. Label everything. Teachers love it when you label it so they know what you're talking about. There are no x-intercepts. There was a y-intercept of minus 1. So here, 0 minus 1. And we stated that the function um, also has a horizontal asymptote of y equals 1, y equals 1. Okay, so I'm here. We don't have any x-intercepts. That means I can't be going up. And I know that to be true as well from my limit that I did on both sides of the asymptotes. So I said as x approached 2 from the left, which is this one here, we approach negative infinity. So it's down on this side. That means it's going to be up on this side, approaching the horizontal asymptote. And the same thing on this side, it's down on this side. It's going to be up on this side and approach this one. And there is a very nice algorithm for curve sketching for you. I hope um, you found these lessons helpful. Uh, give me a thumbs up, a little like, you know, give me some love here. Um, send me a little note, tell me how it's going. If there's anything specific that you didn't understand, ask a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Have a great day.